I think we have Dr. Njoki ready right now. So I would like to uh, welcome you all of you for this uh, presentation. Uh, and I think I'll take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Njoki, who is the main presenter. Uh, Dr. Njoki is a, is a consultant and a sociologist and a, a intensivist. She's based at the uh, Nakuru Level 5 Teaching and Referral Hospital. She's also a lecturer at the Ijato University. Uh, we, today we are going to discuss on alternate uh, modes of ventilation. I believe all of us who work in ICU at some point or the other, we've been uh, stuck with uh, uh, different levels of difficulties in ventilating patients. And uh, as such, we, we are always in search of uh, knowledge and uh, uh, techniques of uh, improving uh, ventilation. And this is partly what Dr. Joki is going to take us through. So, some, some are answering. I think uh, uh, I would like to urge everyone, there is a poll uh, Joki would like us to look at. Kindly look at the, uh, respond to the, call, the poll as she, does, she goes ahead with the presentation. As, because people, some people are still logging in. Okay. So the oh, presentation oh. might take place before um, people answer and... Oh, okay. There might be that. Bit. So this shouldn't be an issue. Okay. All right. So my name is Dr. Caroline Jockey, consultant anesthesiologist and um, intensivist at Nakuru PGH. One minute. Um, are you seeing the whole of my screen? I'm seeing part of my screen is hidden here. You're now seeing it properly? Yeah, yes. I, can, I can see the slide. Looks, All looks right, good. yeah. So I, I'm going to take you through the alternate modes of ventilation. Um, alternate All modes right. mean ventilation modes that can be used, that are used instead of the conventional modes that we already know. But for us to understand alternate modes of ventilation, you have to first understand the conventional modes. So this is quite a wide topic. And a lot, a lot of mechanical ventilation has already been covered previously by Dr. Idris and Dr. Sika. Dr. Idris will be joining me in the panel today as we go through this. So most of the things have already been done. I'll just highlight a few things here and there on what makes these modes a bit different. So I'll start off with this quote. So basically, with that quote, sorry, um, what we are saying is that humankind has tried to uh, develop many, many ventilation modes of mechanical ventilation, but we are yet to get an ideal one. There are over 200 modes of ventilation. You can't go through all of them. You can't know all of them. So now to the first question, Nanga. Are we doing the first question? I'm seeing the poll screen on my laptop. Hello? hello All right. Hello. Yes. Yes, yes. So that is the first, this is the first question. Yeah, yeah, at electron. Yes, yes, yes. So um, the first question, these questions are going to appear in between the slides. Huh? So we'll go with okay. them as we continue. I can see the poll is ongoing. The first question is, at electroma, is in lung injury caused by large volumes delivered by the ventilator to the uninvolved lung? That is a normal lung. So when you give large volumes into a normal, normal parts of the lungs, the normal alveoli, you get the lung injury known as at electroma. Um, I can see 58%, um, the poll is ongoing, say it's true. Well, 41% say it's false. All right. Okay. Let's see my next slide. It will answer that question. So, at electroma is a lung injury caused by large volumes delivered. So, majority think uh, this answer is true. Well, when you're talking of lung injury, at electroma is what the lung injury caused by repeated opening and closing of the alveoli. 
And this is the reason why most ventilators have incorporated the positive end expiratory pressure in their ventilatory modes. If you look at your ventilators when you go back to ICU, you will notice that if you have synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation as a mode of ventilation, it is also being put there in, in together with PEEP to prevent atelectroma. So we don't have the pure conventional modes of ventilations anymore. They have incorporated PEEP in them to avoid atelectroma. So atelectroma is not the injury caused by large volumes. So majority were wrong there. Volutroma, on the other hand, is the lung injury caused by large tidal volumes delivered and distributed to the uninvolved lung, which causes over distension of the normal alveoli. I hope you're together. And this is the basis of the lung protective strategies for low tidal volumes and high positive end expiratory pressures in management of ARDS. So I hope you've got the uh, two definitions, atelectroma and volutroma. We are going to mention them a lot as we go by. Now question two, there it is, is positive pressure ventilation, the desired in positive pressure ventilation, the desired inflation pressure is a control variable. In positive pressure ventilation, the desired inflation pressure is a control variable. Yeah, um, I can see majority, almost 76 versus about 23% say it's true. All right, so majority say it's true. Okay. Fantastic. So... When you're talking about positive pressure ventilation, we have two types of ventilations. I'll first like to introduce you to the reason why we call it positive pressure ventilation for those who are not intensivists and are in this forum. When you're breathing in, you create a negative pressure in your pleura. But the machines that we use nowadays, they blow air into your lungs. You don't create a negative pressure. So that is, it's called positive pressure ventilation. And we have two types, volume control and pressure control ventilation. Control variables are the things that you preset in your machine. For example, when you're using volume control ventilation, you tell the machine, inflate this tidal volume into the patient's lungs and then stop. So you have set a tidal volume of, say, 500 mils. If you're using pressure control, you inform the machine to inflate the lung until a certain pressure is reached. You can set the pressure, for example, at 20 centimeters of water. So the control variables are those variables that we preset. So the answer to that question is true, that pressure, inflation pressure, is a control variable in pressure control ventilation. What are the other control variables that we set on the machine? You can set the, hello, you can still hear me? You can set the respiratory rate. You can set the inspiration time. That's the time taken during inspiration. You can also set flow rates and triggers. So all these things that you preset are known as control variables. What the machine measures, they are known as the measured variables. So question three, regarding patient triggering in mechanical ventilation, we've seen trigger is one of the variables you can set. So regarding trigger, patient triggering in mechanical ventilation, negative pressure triggering has less work of breathing. The patient has to use more work to trigger the machine using what we call negative pressure triggering. So majority of the people, almost equal numbers, almost 52% say true, 49% say false. All right, almost an equal number, say true, say false. So we're not so sure uh, what you're talking about. So regarding patient triggering in mechanical ventilation, negative pressure triggering has less work of breathing. So um, thank you for that. When you're talking about a trigger, we need to understand what a trigger first is. A trigger is a signal used to initiate the beginning of inspiration in the machine. 
or what we call the respiratory cycle. What is going to make this machine start inflating? And then you exhale. What is going to cause that machine to start inflating again? That signal is what we call a trigger. Initially, majority of the ventilators used to use what we call negative pressure triggering, where the patient was required to generate a pressure of two to three centimeters of water to open a pressure sensitive valve so that the machine can sense that and then initiate the breathing cycle. A pressure of two to three centimeters of water is a very high pressure that is required by the patient to initiate triggering. And this negative pressure triggering had increased work of breathing for the patient. And many ventilators, if you check again, when you go triggering, I was explaining mm -hmm. what is flow triggering. Mm -hmm. Hello, you can hear me? Yeah. Yes, oh, yes. Fantastic. So um, as opposed to pressure, negative pressure triggering, the patient has to just simply change the flow in the direction of which gases are moving. So if initially the machine was inflating and then the patient expresses the desire to exhale, they reverse the flow of the gases and that flow is what triggers the respiratory cycle. All right. So most Dr. of the machines Dr. are Dr. now Njoki. using Dr. the Dr. Sorry, to, sorry to interrupt Hello? you, Dr. Njoki. We are unable yes. to see your screen. Yes. Maybe we just restart sharing. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Let me just do that. See my screen now? Yes, we can. We can see your screen All now. All right. We can so see now. I was at the... Okay, then. So that, that I was simply trying to explain the signal and what we mean by triggering and to explain why most ventilators no longer use the negative pressure trigger and instead use the flow. So that, that the answer to that question was actually false. The negative pressure trigger has more increased work of breathing. I'll just briefly just go through these. These are things we already know, and these are the ventilation modes that majority of us use. These are what we call conventional modes of ventilation. We have the assist control ventilation. Sorry. So we have the assist control ventilation, and this is how it works. The machine, gives a full breath to the patient. When the patient initiates a breath, this is a pressure ventilation, a pressure wave form on the ventilator. So it's showing you the changes in pressure as the lungs are inflated uh, or deflated. So once the patient initiates a breath, when you see a negative deflection opposite to the breathing, that is a patient trigger. The patient has changed the pressure, uh, the pressures within the circuit, okay? So when you see a negative deflection, like in this case here, it means the patient is triggering that vent. So once the patient triggers, the machine senses that and tells the machine that you need to, that you need to uh, give the patient a breath. And the machine takes over completely and gives a full breath. Please assist control but we have intermittent mandatory ventilation where the patient is breathing, they are triggering the vent, and then the machine gives a full breath, just like in assist control, but in between the breaths, the patient is allowed to breathe spontaneously. When they trigger the machine again, they are given a full breath. So the difference between assist control and synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation or what we call intermittent mandatory ventilation, is that the patient is allowed periods of breathing spontaneously in between, which is not happening in assist control. Now, when the breath given by the machine synchronizes with the patient's breath, then this becomes synchronized intermittent ventilation. That means the machine will not inflate the lungs when the patient is attempting to exhale. It tries and coincides the mandatory breath that must be given by the machine at the time when the patient is supposed to be inhaling. That's what we call synchronized. Now, when the machine is not synchronizing with the patient's breath, it just gives breaths continuously. And when you ask it to give intermittent mandatory ventilation, regardless of whether the patient is breathing, it will just give these mandatory breaths continuously. They do not need patient triggering. Now, when you give continuous breaths, mandatory breaths, 
continuously without requiring the patient to trigger the ventilator. This is what we call pressure con He can't hear anything, Joaquin. Different from the synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation and the assist control. I'll repeat that again. When the patient triggers the ventilator during assist control ventilation, the machine takes over and gives a full breath. Notice that the patient must trigger the vent. When the patient is allowed to breathe in between the mandatory breaths and they're also triggering this vent, when they trigger, a mandatory breath is given and it's synchronized with what would have been their spontaneous breathing. But more importantly, they are allowed to breathe in between the ventilator breaths. That is called the synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. If no triggering is required, you've simply instructed the machine to just give breaths. Probably after every few minutes or seconds, that is called time cycling. Then that is called pressure or volume control ventilation. Now we have what we call pressure support ventilation. You can also see the patient needs to trigger this ventilator. The patient performs the whole respiration on their own. They have to breathe in on their own and then exhale on their own. When they trigger the vent, they, re they complete this respiratory cycle on their own. The machine does not fully take over that breath, as we saw in assist control and in synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. The patient is largely doing the work of breathing. The only thing in pressure support is that the machine is instructed to give a little support over and above the breath of this patient, but largely the patient breathes on their own. So I hope uh, this chat is important. I hope you have seen the difference between the different conventional modes of ventilation that are usually available in our ventilators. So this is the other question. If exhalation is too short, remember our respiratory cycle is inhalation and expiration. So if the expiration is too short, if the expiration is too short, as may occur with rapid breathing, we don't have adequate time to exhale. We can prolong expiratory phase by increasing the tidal volume. All right, so we don't have enough time to, we can increase the time to breathe out by increasing the tidal volume taken in. But majority think it's false while the rest think it's true, 22%, 79% think it's false. I agree with the false. And this is why. Sorry, I'm trying to go to the, my, my next slide. Here we are. You, we need to understand, sorry. There we are. We need to understand how a respiratory cycle takes place. Now, a respiratory cycle is the full cycle when you ins inspire and expire. So when you breathe in and you breathe out, that is a full respiratory cycle. The rule of thumb when you're setting up your ventilator is to give the inspiration to expiration ratio at one to two. And note, I'm not saying time, I'm saying ratio. Ratio means the duration of the respiratory cycle the ratio of inspiration to expiration is one to two. And this is the reason why. Inhalation is an active process, whether you're doing mechanical ventilation or you are breathing normally. Expiration is a passive process. This is, how, this is pass, exhalation takes place when there's elastic recoil of your lung tissue and your rib cage. And this is what forces the air out of your lungs. So it's a passive process. Ventilators do not assist you to exhale. Now, the exp expiration phase can be prolonged by either increasing the inspiratory flow rate. That means 
you increase the amount of time needed to inflate your lungs so that the rest of the time is used to exhale. That can be done by increasing the flow rate on your ventilator so that the flow of gases is faster during inflation. And this gives more time for you to deflate your lung. You can do this by decreasing your tidal volume. When you decrease your tidal volume, your lungs take a shorter time to fill and therefore the rest of the time can be used to exhale. And that's why that answer was false. When you decrease, you can also decrease the inspiration time, the time used. You can manually decrease that as a control variable on your, on your ventilator. You can decrease the inspiration time by adjusting what you call the ramp or the rise. And this is one of the um, control variables that confuse very many people on the ventilators. What is this ramp? What is this rise? That is what it's used for. You can also change the I to E ratio. You'll see sometimes in some modes like APRV ventilation, we actually reverse. We can prolong the ratio to one to three, for example, in asthma, so that we can prolong the expiration time. So I to E ratio is a control variable on your ventilator. We need to understand the mechanical properties of our lungs. They have been explained over and over again by Dr. Idris in other uh, presentations. We need to understand the forces that act against us when we are inflating a lung. That is what, why we are doing a positive pressure ventilation. We are overcoming some forces so that we can inflate these lungs. We have to overcome the forces known as compliance. Compliance is the ability to distend a lung. So compliance is defined as change in volume per unit change in pressure. And that is the equation there. And if we were to play a little bit of mathematics, don't get lost. If we were to now uh, get pressure, pressure is therefore equal to the compliance times the volume. We need to be together in this. Is everybody with me there? Yes. Hello? Yes, Dr. I will go through that again. Yes, we are there. The okay, fine. Thanks, Dr. Nguyen. We are talking about the properties, the, the, the forces that we need to overcome when we're inflating our lung. One is compliance, or we can also call it elastance or the elastic properties of the lung, the ability to distend them. Compliance is defined as a change in volume per unit change in pressure. Think about inflating a balloon. When you put air into the balloon, it changes in volume. It's compliant. We also have to overcome resistance. This is the force acting against forward flow of gases. It takes place within the trachea and the main bronchus and resistance is a product of resistance to flow times the flow rate so keep an eye on those um, uh, equations one on compliance or the elasticity of the lung and resistance which are the two forces we need to overcome when inflating a lung these are called measured variables and the machine measures this for you and they are the basis of modern day in in intelligent ventilation modes, like we'll see, like those called adaptive minute ventilations. Now, when we're talking about inflating this lung, so we've blown in air into the lung, we have overcome resistive pressures. We have overcome the resistive pressures, which can be abbreviated as P res. There's no P, there's no second P, it's P resistance and we have overcome the elastic forces in the lungs which is abbreviated as p elastic those two pressures we must overcome them to inflate a lung therefore the total pressure in a lung which is known as the p peak the peak pressures in the lungs are both the elastic forces plus the resistive resistive forces when you overcome those two then you get the peak pressures in your lung if we go by the uh, equations we had, uh, I had put previously, elastic forces in the lung is change in volume times change in pressure. The pressure we call pressure elastic to overcome elastic forces is volume times pressure. Whereas the pressure to overcome resistance is resistance to flow times the flow rate. 
So I've simply just substituted those, uh, this with this and resistance with this from this. I hope you're together. So when you're talking about volume control, volume control gives pressure, gives, sorry, gives gases into the lungs continuously. Pressure control, on the other hand, inflates the lung and then stops and allows exhalation. Please remember that. Now, when you're using volume control on a ventilator, since the flow is continuous, we have to stop that flow briefly. So we stop this flow rate briefly. So it becomes zero. When this flow rate becomes zero, resistance to flow times flow rate is equals to zero. So your peak pressures that you measure that time are equal to the pressures needed to overcome the elastic properties of your lungs. So you have eliminated the resistive proper, uh, pressures in your lungs by eliminating flow altogether. And therefore, the pressure you get finally is equal to the peak pressures are equal to this, since this is zero. Therefore, we achieve this. We measure these peak pressures in volume control by pressing that button on your ventilator known as the inspiratory hold button. Some ventilators have an expiratory hold button. Sorry, I meant the inspiratory hold button. I'll correct that in my slides. So when the patient, patient's lungs are inflated and then you press that button, you eliminate flow. So you, the pressures that are measured at that point are equal to the elastic pressures in your lungs. So this is the wave you get when you put an inspiratory hold. This has been said over and over again. You can see this pressure here. This is a pressure waveform during inspiration, pressure time reform is not starting from zero because we have put a peep, a positive end expiratory pressure of say five centimeters of water. So when we inflate our lung, we are inspiring. We reach here. This is called the peak inspiratory pressures. Now, when we eliminate flow by pressing the inspiratory pressure or what you call the inspiratory pause, this pressure drops briefly, it drops briefly, and you get a new pressure here called a plateau pressure. Now that plateau pressure is the pressure that is equivalent to the pressure in your alveoli. And that is the pressure that is required to overcome the elastic properties of your lungs. The pressure that is required to overcome to distend your alveoli, in other words, your compliance pressures. While the one we eliminated here, which is your peak pressures, when you subtract your plateau pressures, that is the pressure that is required to overcome the resistive component of your lungs. So when we are talking of mean airway pressures in the lungs, you'll hear this a lot is the average pressure in the airway during the whole of the ventilatory cycle. And it was calculated by integrating. You remember integration of areas under the curve? By integrating this area under this pressure curve. And that's how we achieve our mean pressures in the airway. So the machine actually calculates this. In a normal lung, our mean pressures can range from five to 10 centimeters of water, but in obstructive conditions, obstructive conditions mean, mean conditions where your, narrow, your airway is narrow, like in asthma, COPD, it's your airway, the resistive component of your lung that has a problem can go from 10 to 20 centimeters. In a non-compliant lung, we call these restrictive diseases where your lung is not compliant, it's not expanding properly these pressures can go as high as 20 to 30 centimeters of water. And these mean airway pressures, which can be put in by the ventilator, have an effect on the cardiac performance. So remember the lungs are not just sitting in the, the lungs are not just sitting in the thoracic cavity alone, they are sitting there with the heart. 
Hello. So this is our heart and these are the lungs. All right. And we have two forces that act on this heart. We have forces known as preload and afterload. Preload is good, afterload is not. Preload is the force that helps the heart to pump out blood from the heart to have a strong stroke volume or enhance cardiac output, while the afterload is the force against which the heart must pump. Now, positive pressure ventilation affects these two forces in this manner. Positive pressure ventilation affects cardiac performance by decreasing afterload. We said afterload is not good. It's a force against which the heart must pump out blood. It decreases afterload by augmenting transmural pressures. Big word, which simply means the pressure on the wall of the heart. So you have put positive pressure into the lungs and they are squeezing this heart. And therefore they are assisting the heart to pump out blood. And therefore they are decreasing afterload. The force, hello, sorry, I'm having internet, sta unstable internet, so I have to keep checking whether I'm still there. So, afterload is decreased by positive pressure ventilation. On the other hand, positive pressure ventilation also has problems. It decreases venous return to the heart. You have inflated the lungs so much, they are compressing the veins that return the very much needed blood back to the heart. So they decrease the heart, the blood going back to the heart, and therefore they decrease your preload. They also increase transmural pressures, which we saw when the heart is in systole, it's desirable to have pressures on the wall of the heart. But what happens during diastole, when the heart is supposed to be filling again with blood? This is not desirable. The distensibility of the heart is interfered with. And therefore, this inadequate feeling of the heart, again, it interferes with preload. Also, when you are providing oxygen into the pulmonary vasculature of your lungs, the pulmonary vasculature reacts to high oxygen levels by vasoconstricting. And therefore, this increased vascular resistance in your pulmonary vessels. And this also causes... Uh, an increase in the pressure against which the heart must pump out. It increases afterload. So you can see that positive pressure ventilation has many, many uh, disastrous effects on the functioning of the heart. And this will come into play when you're ventilating patients who are hypovolemic, for example. Positive pressure ventilation can easily decrease your systolic blood pressures by these effects. They're called cardiopulmonary effects. Now, when you're talking about the modes of ventilation, I prefer to uh, divide them this way. We have conventional modes of ventilation and we have the alternate modes of ventilation. This is where we are dwelling on today. We have already discussed the conventional modes, which is the assist control ventilation. I hope you remember what we said. The intermittent mandatory ventilation, and when it synchronizes with the patient's breath, it's called synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation or SIMV. And then we have pressure support ventilation, and we have already explained what positive end expiratory pressure means. This is under conventional modes of ventilation. Now, under conventional modes of ventilation, these ones I've just mentioned are nowadays known as the open loop modes of ventilation. Why are they open loop? Because you as the person who is manipulating the vent, you have to key in your control variables. And no matter how much the patient's lung change, that machine will not change. If you tell it, give 500 mils as your control variable at 16 breaths per minute. Even if the patient's breathing changes, that ventilator will give exactly what you told it. So it's up to you as a person manipulating the ventilator to go and change this ventilator according to the patient's needs. So we have to keep winning this patient's needs on the ventilator yourself. That's why it's an open loop. But in the closed loop modes of conventional ventilation, machines have been made in such a way that they sort of interact with the patients and then there's a controller somewhere that compares what you have told the machine to give and 
what the patient is actually receiving and make some comparison and then gives what it, what it feels it desires fit. So it's a more interactive ventilation. So sometimes you don't even have to go and manipulate the ventilator yourself. The machine does it for you by measuring all those mechanical properties we have talked about. These are now known as the closed loop of ventilation. And believe me or not, there are over 174 such modes. In the alternate modes of ventilation, these are the ventilation modes that we use instead of the conventional modes when the conventional modes are no longer able to meet the patient's need, like in severe, severe ARDS, or when they're not needed at all. Sometimes you don't need to introduce a tube down the patient's throat and ventilate that patient. You can simply use an interface like a mask and ventilate them using non-invasive ventilation. So NIV falls under alternate modes of ventilation. Ventilation modes that are used when the conventional modes are no longer working or they are not needed. This is just an example of what I was saying about open and closed loops. I have already explained what the open loop means and what the closed loop in the most intelligent forms of ventilation are like. And this, I'll just remind you, these are very important uh, pressure waveforms of the conventional modes of ventilation, ACV, SIMV, pressure control, and pressure support ventilation. We have already seen that. This is what I was trying to explain about the, about the closed loop uh, ventilator modes. Our control variable we have set here is a tidal volume, for example, in volume control ventilation. And then the machine has a feedback signal that observes the tidal volume that the patient is actually taking in. I'll give you an example. You have set a tidal volume of 500 mils. So every time the patient inspires, the machine gives 500. Initially, maybe the patient was not breathing, but now they're able to take 100 mils on their own. So the patient is going to inspire 500 plus 100 and that is going to be 600. So what happens is that the machine sends this signal back, observes what the tidal volume the patient is actually inspiring, takes it back, incorporates the mechanical properties we have learned about known as compliance and elastance and resistance, compares them with the lung signal and sends the information back to the controller and the output is a new desired tidal volume. So it's an intelligent form of ventilation. This feedback loop is what makes this a closed, uh, a closed uh, mode, closed loop mode of ventilation. And a ventilation mode like adaptive minute ventilation or what you call adaptive support ventilation is actually a ventilation that incorporates all these modes together. The assist control ventilation, synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, and pressure support ventilation. Sorry, this should be pressure support ventilation. And incorporates all of them and gives the patient the desired type of ventilation depending on the mechanical properties of the lungs of the patient, whether they are worsening or improving. It is based on this Otis equation. I have tried to look at the derivation of this Otis equation so that I can teach you, and I must admit I have failed. Nevertheless, the basis of this Otis equation incorporates all these mechanical properties of the lungs that we are talking about. It incorporates the airway resistance and the respiratory compliance together. It incorporates what we call the ventilation that is taking place in the alveoli, the alveoli ventilation. Remember, the, ventil the gaseous exchange only takes place in the terminal bronchioles and in the alveoli. The gas in your trachea and your bronchi does not take part in gaseous exchange. So this equation here. Hello, sorry. Are you speaking to me or somebody has not muted? Hello? Yes, yes, go ahead. Oh, I think okay. All right. Thank you. I thought someone was speaking to me. Well, it incorporates all these properties, resistance, compliance, and the alveoli ventilation, and incorporates other, co other um, constants that 
look at the flow of fluid in a sinus because that whole pathway from the trachea all the way to the alveoli, that is a sinus. And this is what came up with the Otis equation. Now remember this Otis equation is coming, is, is basically F is frequency. So it's looking at the respiratory rate at which the work of breathing will be the least. It has incorporated all those. That is the basis in a nutshell of these newer modes of ventilation, like the one you're calling adaptive minute ventilation or adaptive support ventilation and other, um, many other uh, intelligent modes of ventilation. This is basically what we're seeing. You're trying to get the respiratory rate at which there's the minimal work of breathing using all those parameters. There are other many closed loop systems that you're going to see in ventilators that might confuse you. And one is the PRVC, pressure regulated volume control. This is a hybrid of volume control and pressure control. It gives a constant volume like volume control, but limits the pressure in the lungs like pressure control. So it's an intelligent form of ventilation, which is closed loop. There's no clinical advantage that has been shown with this method of ventilation, and it's probably why it's falling out of favor with many ventilators. Now, this is the other question. Dr. Nganga, maybe you can do this, Paul. High frequency, low volume oscillation ventilation, HFOV, mean airway pressures are about twice those in continuous mandatory ventilation. Continuous mandatory ventilation is a conventional mode of ventilation. HFOV is an alternate mode of ventilation. Okay, I can see majority think it's false, 59, 60. Well, few think it's true. High frequency, low ventilation, um, low HFOV, mean airway pressures are about twice those in CMV. So majority think is, this is false, All right? Let's have a look at the next slide, then we'll understand. So majority were wrong, and this is why. When you're talking of alternate modes of anesthesia, we have talked about the conventional modes of ventilation. They're used when, they are not, when the conventional modes of ventilation are not sufficient or necessary. And we will limit their use here in this presentation to acute respiratory failure. Now, the two kind of modes we have is the rescue modes of ventilation, like the one I've mentioned, high frequency oscillatory ventilation and airway pressure release ventilation, what we call APRV. Those are called rescue modes. We use them in severe, severe ARDS when conventional modes we've mentioned before are not sufficient. We also have non-invasive ventilation. This is where non-invasive ventilation comes in and it incorporates these other ventilation modes we've already mentioned like CPAP, BiPAP, and pressure support. Now, you need to understand this open lung concept for you to understand these alternate modes of ventilation. The concept of ventilation used to open atelectactic atelectasis is when the alveoli collapse. So the concept of ventilation used to open atelectatic alveoli gently and to keep them from, pre from collapsing after you've opened them. This is what's the concept on which most of these newer ventilator modes, these alternate ventilator modes is based on. So in other words, in other words, you open the lung, open the lung and keep the lung open. That is a concept. Now high frequency oscillatory ventilation. This is where the ventilator gives very low tidal volumes of almost one to two mils. Remember our tidal volume when we are breathing on average is about 500 mils. But in HFOV, it's giving you very small tidal volumes of about one to two mils at very high frequency oscillations. These small volumes prevent volotrauma. These frequent high frequency oscillations create a mean airway pressure 
And this high mean airway pressure is what recruits the alveoli. Recruiting means opening up alveoli that are atelectatic, which is a problem we have in ARDS. For more optimum effect, it's important that you move from a conventional mode of ventilation that was using high peeps before you transfer a patient to high frequency uh, oscillatory ventilation. Overall, the mean airway pressures generated in high frequency oscillatory ventilations are almost double those in conventional mandatory ventilation. Sorry, conventional modes of ventilation. So the pressures generated are much, much higher because of these high oscill frequent oscillations. Now, when we're doing the high frequency oscillatory ventilation for people who have not used this ventilator before, our control variables, this means what we preset is the frequency with which we're going to give these oscillations. Frequency is measured in hertz. And a hertz means, one hertz means one oscillation per second or 60 oscillations per minute. So typically, we start with about four to seven hertz. That means about 240 to 420 oscillations per minute. That means a lot of oscillations per minute. This oscillation frequency is inversely proportional to the amplitude of the wave. Before I go any further, I'd like to show you this figure. This is a wave. Inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration inspiration, expiration, high frequency oscillation. This graph has been superimposed on, con on the conventional ventilator where you inflate your lungs and then you expire. You come here again, you trigger and then you inflate again and then you expire. So these are two superimposed graphs. On this side, these are the pressures that can be reached safely when you are doing your conventional modes of ventilation. But these are the pressures which you are able to achieve when you're doing high frequency oscillatory modes of ventilation. When we magnify this wave here to here, you can see this is inspiration, expiration. This is what you call the amplitude of the wave. This is what you call the frequency and is measured in hertz. The amplitude, that is how high up this wave rises, is equivalent to your tidal volume. So if you lower your amplitude, your tidal volume will be low. All right. Now, when you increase your amplitude, your tidal volume goes up. Now, you, when you increase your amplitude, the machine has to take a longer period to generate this wave. Therefore, as your amplitude goes up, your frequency becomes shorter. So you cannot increase your amplitude and your frequency at the same time. If you are to decrease your, your if you are to increase your frequency. Okay, you have to lower your amplitude and therefore your tidal volume. So that's why we are saying when you're setting your control variables, the frequency is inversely proportional to the amplitude. Now the amplitude is another control variable that we set. The lower amplitudes generate faster oscillation and less tidal volume. Therefore they will generate higher pressures when they are lower amplitudes. The higher amplitudes generate slower oscillation, but higher tidal volumes. So you can understand how you can manipulate your amplitude, which is more or less the same as I to E ratio, depending on the patient's carbon dioxide levels. Now, when you are also, you also have to set your mean peak airway pressures on that machine. How do we set our mean peak airway pressures? We set them at five centimeters above the plateau pressures that you measured with your previous conventional mode that we are using. Remember we said the high frequency oscillatory ventilation is an alternate mode of ventilation, meaning your patient was on a previous conventional mode. When you measure your plateau pressures by putting an inspiratory pose, now you add five centimeters of water, that is the mean peak airway pressure you're going to set in your HFOV, but do not exceed 30 centimeters of water. 
What are the advantages of high frequency oscillatory ventilation? There's a most recent study by Sud et al. that showed that high frequency, which compared high frequency versus conventional ventilator for treatment of acute lung injury and ARDS, and it found a significant benefit in survival. But there is no study specifically comparing high frequency oscillatory ventilation with other advanced lung protective strategies that were arrived as were arrived at in the acute respiratory distress syndrome network, where we discuss advanced lung protective strategies such as low volumes, high peeps. No study has compared the two to show any survival benefit. But nevertheless, a few have shown that high frequency uh, ventilation has shown a significant uh, survival benefit in severe ARDS with, compared to conventional ventilation. The disadvantages is that it requires a special ventilator. The first time I saw one was outside the country. I've never seen one here. And it's not readily available. So, and also many people don't know how to use it. Another thing is that you have seen the very high pressures, almost double those in conventional ventilation that are generated with HFOV. And this can reduce your cardiac output through reduction of preload through those mechanisms we talked about. So especially in hypovolemic patients due to these high mean pressures. Now, when you're talking about non-invasive ventilation, this is the next question. CPAP mode. CPAP mode benefits in pulmonary edema involve augmentation of tidal volume for better oxygenation. In other words, CPAP assists people with pulmonary edema by increasing the tidal volume given to the patient. Is this true or false? Let me just start by talking about, just, just keep that question in mind. Huh? I need to talk about what we call uh, CPAP, but for you to understand CPAP, you have to understand transpulmonary pressures. What are we talking about? You hear this mentioned a lot. Transpulmonary pressures, who is drawing across my screen? I'm seeing red things appearing across my screen. Are you seeing them, Shelmin? Hello? Hello, yes, I can see. I'm seeing red things appearing across my screen. Are you seeing them also? <laughs> I, I can't see them on my end. Yes, okay, yes, maybe yes. it's just my screen. Sorry. Okay. No, you are. Do you seem to be drawing some things there? Like now. I, I don't know who is drawing really. Somebody what is drawing on the screen? Red. You can. <laughs> someone can draw. There's a hacker. The shell means. Please check your admission. Maybe there's someone who was hacked. Okay, fine. But you can see the picture. When you're talking about transpulmonary pressures, we're talking about the difference between your alve the pressure in your alveoli and that one inside your intrapleural pleural pressures. So inside your alveoli here, when you breathe in, the maximum pressures in your alveoli are actually the atmospheric pressure. Remember, atmospheric pressure is what pushes, pushes the air into an alveoli. So we take it as 760 millimeters of mercury, all right? But your intrapleural pressure is usually four millimeters less. Okay, this is the pressure between your, your visceral and your, and your parietal pleura. And that's why, the, why we are able to create a negative pressure, expand our lungs so that the atmospheric pressure can push in air. This is not necessary when you're doing positive pressure ventilation because you simply push air pressure into the lungs. But when you're talking about transpulmonary pressures, that is what we mean. So it's usually four millimeters less than the pressure in the alveolar. And that's where your lung is able to expand. Now, when you're talking about positive end expiratory pressure, it means this is a pressure that is placed to prevent your alveoli from collapsing. We saw this in the beginning. The small airways and alveoli tend to collapse, especially in dependent parts of the lung, all right? The lung bases where the transpulmonary pressures are more positive due to gravity. For example, when the patient is lying supine, gravity is acting on the lung. So the closing pressures 
when we say closing pressure, you see this term again, is a transpulmonary pressure where the distal airways and the alveoli finally close. And this is typically three centimeters of water. So when the closing pressure is reached, your alveoli become atelectactic. Closing pressures are usually very high in obstructive conditions like COPD. You need a lot of pressure to uh, close those airways, those alveoli, but they are very low in restrictive diseases like ARDS. That means they easily collapse in such conditions. And this is the basis of why we will hear many people saying we prone our patients who have ARDS, and we're doing this even in COVID. Now, PIP, we had said, is incorporated in many, many ventilator modes. Positive and expiratory pressure is simply pressure which is being put in your alveoli towards expiration when you're expiring so that you don't get atelectasis. And the typical settings are between five to seven centimeters of water above what we call the closing pressure to ensure the alveoli remain open. I'd like to state that PEEP has been incorporated in conventional modes such as ACV, IMV and SIMV and pressure support ventilation. And the modern day ventilators do not have conventional modes in their pure form. So when you go to set your ventilator and you have synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation and you see this PEEP there, those are two modes. They've just been incorporated in one because of that reason. So don't be confused. Now, when you're talking about CPAP, with, in which the question was referring to, continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP is simply positive and expiratory pressure applied in a spontaneously breathing patient. That is what you call CPAP. It is a simple, it is a simple mode that requires only oxygen, a mask, and an expiratory valve that maintains this PEEP. CPAP increases the amount of air that remains in the lung towards expiration, at the end of expiration. This is called functional residual capacity. And therefore, it prevents atelectasis. CPAP does not augment tidal volumes. So CPAP does not assist you to breathe in like pressure support or assist control or intermittent mandatory ventilation. It does not even have a button for setting tidal volume. It simply gives you a peep against which you expire. And typical CPAP machines have pressure ranging from five to 10 centimeters of water. Therefore, when I give an MCQ and I say CPAP assists pulmonary uh, edema patients by augmenting the tidal volume. It's wrong. CPAP does not augment tidal volume. It just simply provides a PIP against which a spontaneous breathing patient expires. The principal use of CPAP in acute respiratory failure secondary to pulmonary edema, especially cardiogenic pulmonary edema, is as a, a result of the hemodynamic support of reducing the afterload. We have talked about the cardiopulmonary interactions, and this is how CPAP benefits patients with cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It reduces the afterload by simply acting as a hand, squeezing and increasing the transpulmonary pressure, trans, uh, transmural pressures across the heart and aiding the heart to pump out the stroke volume. Now, I'd like you to look at this uh, slide uh, carefully. It's the pressure waveforms of different modes of ventilation that are used in non-invasive ventilation. We have a normal breathing person. It comes from zero. You inspire, expire, inspire, expire. Now, when you add CPAP, you notice your breathing cycle, respiratory cycle, does not start from zero. It starts from a set pressure above that. That is called CPAP. The patient is still breathing spontaneously. Now, when you're talking of BiPAP or what we call bilevel positive airway pressure, you set 
a high in spiratory pressure and you have a low in spiratory pressure. And the patient breathes at a high in spiratory pressure for some time, and then the patient breathes at a low in spiratory pressure for some time. Then they breathe at a high in spiratory pressure for some time, then they breathe at a low in spiratory pressure for some time. I'll repeat that again. In CPAP, in simply a patient inspiring at a set positive pressure. But in BiPAP, you set an inspiratory pressure, a high one and a low one, and the patient at any one time breathes at that pressure, and then the machine allows the patient to breathe at this low pressure. Then they breathe at that high pressure, then they breathe again at that low pressure. That is called BiPAP or bi level pressure support vent pressure. BiPAP. All right? Okay. So, do you have this question, Shelmin? Hello, Shelmin, do you have this? Yes, thank you very much. Bilevel airway pressure release ventilation is a variant of CPAP mode of ventilation. Bilevel airway pressure release ventilation is a variant of CPAP mode of ventilation. I am impressed with this question. Majority think it's true. Almost 74%, 28% think it's false. Thank you very much. So majority are correct. BiPAP or bi-level airway, pre bi bi and airway pressure release ventilation are indeed variants of continuous positive airway pressure. I'll just go back a bit. You can see. We have a set positive pressure right there. They are both starting at that pressure. So indeed, this is a variant of this, okay? There's some continuous positive airway pressure taking place there. So this, we are calling the airway pressure release ventilation, is indeed a variant of continuous positive airway pressure. It is also a variant of BiPAP, by level positive airway pressure. It is simply giving CPAP at high pressures for a brief period of a brief period and then pressure release to exhale carbon dioxide is is given. So the patient breathes at very high pressures and then the valve is released and then the pressure is released and the pressures drop down to almost zero to exhale carbon dioxide. Remember, when your patient is breathing at very high pressures, there's in inadequate exhalation. Now, the high pressures are maintained in this manner to recruit alveoli and also to prevent at electroma. This is the open lung concept we are talking about. The control variables that we normally set, and nowadays most of the uh, ventilators have this mode, we set the control variables. We set the high pressures at which the, the patient should inspire and sustain but they should not exceed 30 centimeters. And as we said, APRV is an alternate mode of ventilation. How do we set our high airway pressures from the previous conventional mode of ventilation that you are using? But they should not exceed 30 centimeters. So you measure, like in high frequency oscillation, the previous plateau pressures. That will be used to measure your high airway pressures. And then you set a low airway pressure. This is the pressure at which when the release occurs, the pressure release occurs, that, that uh, pressure will drop down to that. And it's normally set at zero. Note that airway collapse does not take place when the pressures go down to zero because it is such a brief period. Most of the time is spent in high pressure time, about four to six seconds, which is about 85 to 90% of the total respiratory cycle. And only a brief period of about 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 second does the pressure release. And therefore, the pressures hardly ever reach zero when there's a release, and this release is put in place to exhale carbon dioxide. APRV, or airway pressure release ventilation, is only beneficial in spontaneously breathing patients. When you decide to paralyze your patient like we do in severe ARDS, just Paralyze the patient, sedate and paralyze your patient and put them on the conventional mode of ventilation. 
So this is what I was explaining. When you look at CPAP, your patient is simply breathing at a, 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 a set pressure of five centimeters of water. The patient is breathing at that pressure. That is called CPAP. It does not augment your tidal volume. Then we have BiPAP, where you have set your EPAP and IPAP, expiratory pressure, inspiratory pressure, expiratory pressure, inspiratory pressure. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> that is not corona. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have APRV. APRV, your patient is simply inspiring. The full cycle is being inspired at a very high pressure and then suddenly releases, take, takes place, carbon dioxide is expired and then we return to our very high pressures. So if you look at it critically and then you look at BiPAP, they are more or less the same thing. Your patients are all breathing at a higher than normal pressures. They are variants of each other. <clears throat> the difference between APRV and BiPAP is simply the duration spent in the low pressure zone for the BiPAP is longer than the APRV. For the APRV is very brief. And then we go back to the high pressures. This is a very high PIP. So these modes are all variants of each other. I hope you are together on that. And these graphs show you the difference. Now, some, the BiPAP mode is the one which came first. So you can find many ICUs have the older versions of the machines that only give BiPAP and do not have APRV. So what some intensivists do is they modify this BiPAP into APRV. What, how do we do that? We reduce the expiratory portion, the time spent in the low pressure zone by reversing maybe the I to E ratio and that will mimic APRV. I would not recommend that if you don't know how to do that. It's simply just easier using an APRV machine, but that is the difference between APRV and BiPAP. The advantages of airway pressure release ventilation is that it has been shown to offer nearly complete recruitment over 24 hours without the risk of volutrauma. And it uses this concept of open the lungs and keeps them open. The disadvantages is that it's only useful for spontaneously breathing patients. If in the worst case scenario, you have to paralyze and sedate your patient, you have to revert back to your continuous mandatory ventilation, for, to your conventional modes of ventilation. It is also contraindicated in obstructive conditions where the resistive <clears throat> portion of your lungs is high like in COPD and asthma, be, and because this causes type 2 respiratory failure, okay? This difficulty in expiring. So when you have an APRV mode where the duration of expiring carbon dioxide is so short, you'll make it worse. And it also generates very high mean pressures, just like high-frequency oscillatory ventilation, and cardiopulmonary interactions can cause a decrease in cardiac output. We have already talked about the BiPAP mode and the control variables that need to be set are those ones. So that APRV and high frequency oscillatory ventilatory modes, they are alternate modes of ventilation and so is non-invasive. Non-invasive ventilation is not a unique, is not a difficult mode of ventilation to understand. And the only difference with non-invasive ventilation and invasive ventilation the interface tools, which is intubation tube, an ETT endotracheal tube, or a tracheostomy tube, all right, or a laryngeal mask is going through an orifice. In non-invasive, however, we are using a mask, and that's why it's non-invasive. But the modes of ventilation are exactly the same principles as I had explained earlier. The modes used in non-invasive are CPAP, BiPAP, and pressure support ventilation, which we have discussed, and the principles are the same, whether you're using non-invasive or invasive. When you're using BiPAP in non-invasive mode of ventilation, you're able to give slightly higher pressures than in CPAP. CPAP is also a mode of ventilation used in non-invasive 
We have already said BIPAP and CPAP do not augment tidal volumes. They simply keep the lungs open and prevent atelectasis. Should you feel the need to augment tidal volumes, you need another mode of ventilation, not BIPAP, not CPAP. And this brings us to pressure support ventilation in non-invasive. We already said earlier that pressure support ventilation, the patient triggers the vent <clears throat> and then the ventilator augments that breath but eventually the patient has to do the most of the breathing. They go through the respiratory cycle themselves. The patient only augments. And like in assist control, where the machine takes over the breath. So pressure support ventilation in non-invasive ventilation is when you feel that your patient needs augmentation in their tidal volumes. Now you will notice that CPAP, just like PEEP, is usually combined in ventilators together with pressure support ventilation to increase the functional capacity and to prevent atelectasis and atelectroma. So when you're setting your pressure support mode, you might see a, a button for also setting your CPAP. They're just two modes incorporated in one. <clears throat> pressure support ventilation is a preferred non-invasive mode of ventilation for several conditions. You set a control variable, we have the inflation pressures, you also set CPAP, and it's not recommended to give pressures above 20 centimeters of water as inflation pressures because they are poorly tolerated by the patient and they also cause leakage through the mask. And when leakage through the mask occurs, you cancel the benefits of invasive positive pressure that are taking place. So if you find you're giving, you have to set inflation pressures of more than 20 in non-invasive ventilation, you probably rethink what you're doing with non-invasive ventilation. The overall pressures in pressure support ventilation include the inflation pressure, let's say it's 10, plus the CPAP, which is 5, so the pressure here is 15. How do we select a patient for non-invasive ventilation? If you don't understand anything today about NIV, please remember this slide. It will help you. In short, what we are saying, for non-invasive ventilation, unlike invasive ventilation, you need a cooperative patient who can protect the airway and the condition should not be life-threatening. So this is a simple checklist that I use when starting on NIV. I ask myself, A, I want to know whether the patient needs NIV in the first place. Are they in respiratory failure or respiratory distress? If there are signs of respiratory distress, such as nasal flaring, tachypnea, use of accessory muscles, yes. You can also do a blood gas analysis and look at the concentration of oxygen that you're giving this patient and compare the two. That is called the partial pressure of oxygen, FiO2 ratio. If it's less than 200, then your patient is truly hypoxic. Yes, then this is a patient who needs some support or the other. Now you ask yourself, now you're looking at the cooperation and the ability of the patient to protect the airway. Now, the checklist. If that above are true, yeah? seizures such that they cannot uh, cooperate? Do they have the inability to protect the airway? Is there vomiting with the risk of aspiration, laryngeal edema? Is there laryngeal edema or recent head and neck surgeries? If the, patient, if the answer to each of these is no, then this is a good patient to start your NIV. Remember, patient selection is the single most important factor in determining the success or failure of non-invasive ventilation. What is the efficacy? I think this is among my last slides. What is the efficacy of non-invasive ventilation in hypercapnic respiratory failure, or what we call type 2 respiratory failure, where your carbon dioxide levels go up? Non-invasive ventilation 
is the first line of therapy for acute exacerbations of I am very sorry. I need to change that. Not COVID. I'm thinking of Corona a lot. Acute exacerbation of COPD. It's an obstructive condition. COPD, not COVID. So <clears throat> in COPD, non-invasive is a first line of therapy. And it has shown a marked decline in the rate of intubation and mortality among patients with acute exacerbations who were put on NIV. The preferred mode of ventilation is pressure support ventilation with CPAP. We also use it in other conditions like obesity hypoventilation syndrome where CPAP and BiPAP are the recommended modes. And some studies have been done in asthma, although not adequately as far as status asthmaticus is concerned. So in status asthmaticus, majority of the time we end up intubating this patient. However, in moderate to mild uh, asthma, it has known, been shown to hasten the resolution of acute illness and ICU length of stay. What are some of the adverse effects of non-invasive ventilation? You're blowing air through an unsecured airway. You are definitely going to get gastric distension. This is a common complaint you'll get with your patients due to air insufflation. Most of the time, you will find us putting an NG tube as we initiate NIV. This has also been associated with an increased uh, incidence of nosocomial pneumonia because positive pressure tends to retard mucociliary clearance. Thank you. Dr. Nganga. Thank you, Dr. Joki, for that uh, detailed and uh, very elaborate uh, presentation. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of comments and uh, questions on the, on the chats. Uh, but before we go to the question and answer session, I would like us to invite our partners. And today, we are very privileged to have a Crown Healthcare. Uh, partnering with us in this presentation. We're very grateful for their continued support uh, in KSK. And at this point, I'll invite uh, their representative, uh, Thomas Kitonga, to tell us uh, what they'll teach us today. Karibu, Kitonga. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nganga. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Njoki. Uh, maybe, uh, Doc, you could uh, start my video. Don't mind. Well, even as wait for Shelmeth to do that, uh, let me say this very quickly. Uh, yes, my name is Thomas Kitonga. Uh, I'm in charge of uh, cells in Crown of Care. Um, mine is very brief. Mine is simply to appreciate the team. Thank you, KSA team members. Uh, thanks, um, Dr. Njoki and the team. We've, uh, we've had a very good uh, uh, interaction with uh, most of you uh, personally. Um, and uh, we appreciate for your some. So um, we simply want to appreciate every every bit of support. We've been working together. It has been a journey. We appreciate uh, the support that we've gotten from uh, most of you who are working with the tier one hospitals all the way down to the smallest dispensaries. Um, um, we, we, we appreciate every bit of coordination. We don't take this for granted. We've been together every other year during the annual scientific conferences, um, you know, small presentations, CMEs at the hospital level, and we sincerely appreciate all this. Um, so uh, just a quick one, within one and a half minutes, I'll say this. Um, uh, as most of you might know, some of you perhaps not, uh, in Crown of Care, we, we normally say that uh, we are end-to-end -end hospital solutions. We have something for everyone, we have something for every department, whether it's critical care, whether it's um, um, at the a and &E department, whether it's at the triage, we have something for everyone. And uh, we are out to work with the team, to work with your people. Um, and one thing that we keep saying, and I want to repeat that right away, is that uh, as we continue working together, we are not angels, we are not uh, perfect. So whatever it is that you need to come across uh, in the industry, uh, not just about Crown, 
uh, if you come across something that you feel we need to improve on, whether it's on matters to do with SOPs as you continue working, whether it's on matters revolving around a particular product, uh, please talk to us. We're going to talk to our partners. Uh, and uh, we like it when we get input from you guys when you come across a band letter or a patient monitor or a syringe pump or whatever it is and you say, guys, I wish this knob was on this other corner. I wish this kind of parameter was changed to keep it this, uh, uh, in this particular way. So really, um, we have some of you who have given some of these uh, statements and uh, we've, we've uh, escalated and talked to our principals out there who are doing manufacturing. We've talked to R&D departments elsewhere and we've heard some of them embracing some of your statements and uh, this has been fantastic. Please uh, keep on talking to us. We like listen to you guys. Uh, that's the way we're going to perfect uh, the journey all together and meet the, uh, the requirements of that um, patient out there at the hospital level. So having said that, um, uh, allow me to invite uh, one gentleman called Ayub. Um, Ayub works for Mindray, uh, is based in Morocco. Uh, Ayub is, um, is an application specialist with the Mindray uh, PMLS products. It's unfortunate, and I'll say this, Ayub, with your permission, Ayub has been stuck in this country for the last, I think, close to three months now. Um, he came in and uh, just a day after he landed to Nairobi, the international airports were locked. So he's been here until maybe first of next month. So Ajub, if you're there, if you're listening to me, if you can hear me, please take over and uh, do a small presentation on behalf of both Mindray and Crown of Care. Thank you so much, team. Let's continue working together. God bless you. So today, uh, I'm very happy to, to attend with you this uh, webinar. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the partners, uh, Brown Healthcare, for this uh, very interesting webinar, and with all KSA team members. And uh, special thanks also to Dr. Njuki for this fruitful and interesting presentation. Uh, my name is uh, My name is Ayu. I'm a product support. And um, uh, as Mr. Tikunga said, I'd like to take this uh, uh, opportunity to a very brief conversation about our ventilators. Ventilators, final vent series. In my mind, we have two kinds of ventilators. We have turbine ventilators and magnetic ventilators. Turbine ventilators, it can work without uh, air supply and it's suitable for adults and pediatric patients. Uh, it can be also used for intra-hospital transport. From the magic ventilators, we have two kinds of models, SV800 and SV600. The main difference between two, these two models, it's uh, the screen size and also the transpulmonary pressure because with SV800, we can monitor also the transpulmonary pressure. As you see, the ventilator is a modular ventilator, which we can insert the CO2 module and the SpO2 module. We can even share these modules with the, our patient monitors. Even it's pneumatic ventilators, we can have also a backup air supply, means it can be used in some cases for intra-hospital transports. So the main uh, target of this presentation is just to, to, to show you uh, the most clinical features that we have, what we, uh, what we have in our ventilators. You know, the, common, the most common headache uh, coming when we use the ventilators we can say, for example, the patient ventilators asynchrony. Uh, we need this kind of versatile ventilator which can support us for all the ventilation stage from intubation to extubation. So we need to have also many tools to have a length protective ventilation and many tools also, many interesting tools to do a successful winning. So our main features, uh, main features in, ventil in mind ray ventilator we can find intelligent ventilators, ventilation, and we will discuss about it, length protective ventilation, and then weaning also. So what's, what we can offer in weaning for length protective ventilation and intelligent ventilation. So the first part is intelligent ventilation. And I think uh, already Dr. Njuki discussed about EMV, adaptive minute ventilation. 
uh, I try to be simple how it's worked this ventilation mode. You know, it, we can we deliver three cycles of breath and we measure the respiratory mechanics, means resistance and compliance. And only one mode will adjust the, the, the frequency, the level of support depends on the patient situation. With the conventional ventilators, you should use a PRVC, for example, switch for PRVC to SIMV to volume support. With IMV, you will use only one mode, taking charge your patient from intubation to extubation. Okay? So, and of course, depends on the patient situations. It can be control or partially support or spontaneous support. So, how it's worked, of course, the first thing is you need to input the height. To, to, calc to, to, to calculate the ideal body weight and to input the, 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 the target percent of minute volume with the FiO2. And the, the ventilator will adjust, the level of support will adjust even the, ventilator, the ventilation mode depends on the patient situation. So imagine you use only one mode, of course, it will, will minimize the human intervention reduce the training requirement, and also standardizing the care. The second features we have in intelligent ventilation is IntelliCycle. IntelliCycle means automatic expiratory trigger. Dr. Njuki already discussed about the expiratory uh, phase and how we can adjust also the expiratory time, especially in pressure support. You know, the pressure support, we cannot adjust the TI. So we need to adjust the expiratory trigger. So for this case, in, in the conventional, all the conventional ventilators, you can adjust the expiratory trigger manually. So in Mindray, we have automatic trigger, expiratory trigger. We can adjust also manually, but we have also automatic means that we can adjust the expiratory trigger depends on the patient situations. If you look at here, we have a pressure support of 10, PEEP of three, and uh, we have PEEP of three, and the, the peak pressure is 13. So if you look at the, the TI here, inspiratory time here is longer than this TI, means that here we have an early cycling of, of the breath. So the ventilator adjusts the expiratory trigger, depends on the patient situation. And of course, when, we can, when we adjust this expiratory trigger depends on the patient situation, we will reduce the patient ventilator asynchrony and we will reduce also the workload, workload of the doctor and the work of breathing of the, the patient. This is the IntelliCycle. The third features we have in intelligent ventilation is a pulmocyte. Pulmocyte is intuitive flank, which show us the respiratory mechanics, resistance, compliance, even spontaneous breathing. So it's an intuitive length which show us if there is any, any sudden change of, uh, uh, of resistance, we can check this by the color change. So if the compliance change, you can see this real time feedback in your intuitive length. So even here, if this is a normal length, and we have also the diaphragm, the trigger. So if there is any spontaneous, uh, spontaneous uh, breathing, we can detect this also. Even the volume, if your patient is hypoventilated or hyperventilated. So the pulmocyte is an intuitive length, which show us uh, a real-time feedback of resistance, compliance, and even if there is any spontaneous breath. The, third, the, the fourth feature that we have in intelligent ventilation is CPRV mode. What does it mean, CPRV mode? It means, you know, you are doing the CPR. With the conventional ventilators, when you are starting doing the CPR with the ventilators, of course, the pressures goes up. So when the pressures goes up, of course, you will have a lot of alarms because you are doing the CPR. This is the first thing. The second thing is, uh, the recommendations is to try to, uh, to have from 100 to 120 compression per minute, compression per minute. So 
at, with this condition, I don't know if you will be really uh, sure that you are giving from 100 to 120 compression per minute. Third thing is also, it's not only the alarms, not only the, the frequency, the, 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 fre the compression frequency, but also uh, the oxygenations. We need, when we start to, to do the, uh, the, the CPR, we need to increase the oxygenation at 100%. So what's the main uh, benefits behind the CPRV? CPRV, it's a like a ventilation, a ventilation modes accessible. Once you press in the CPRV, the first thing, he will increase the oxygenation at 100%. He will readjust this alar the alarm limits to be focused on your patient when you start doing the CPR. And he will remove the false and trigger, uh, remove all the triggers and termination. And try to focus on your compression and the patient. Now, how you can be sure that you are given from 100 to 120 compression rates per minute. When you press to, to, uh, to CPRV mode, you can adjust the compression frequency and it will give you a beep, 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 and you will synchronize your CPRV according to the beep. And then, and here you will be sure that you are given from 100 to 120 compression per minute. And of course, the ventilator will continue to ventilate your patient with the tidal volume and frequency. So he will readjust the alarms, uh, increase the oxygenation at 100%, and you can set the compression rate. The second part is leg protection. Leg protection, especially for RDS patients, what we can offer also is PV tools. We use it too much for RDS patients to determine the, opt the optimal PEEP. So this is a PV curves, so it determines us the low inflection points and the upper inflection points. Normally, we set the PEEP, it's a low inflection point plus two, and this is the optimal PEEP that you should give to your patient. So we try to apply a very small VT to minimize the stretching force, and also we can set the, the max, the, the inspiratory pressure less than the upper inflection point to avoid over distances. So over distension. So we have this length protection tools also, PV tools. And this is the sitting. We start by starting pressure. We try to have a low flow and maximum pressure that we should not exceed and volume limit that you should not exceed. And you will have this curve and you can detect the, the low inflection point and upper inflection point. The second features for length protective or uh, length protection is length recruitment. We know all that we can do a length recruitment by increasing a peep, by a holding pressure sometimes. And we have also sustained high pressure like a CPAP. You can adjust your CPAP from 30 to 50, the holding pressure, and you can even customize the holding time from 20 to 40. And this is one of the maneuver that can help you to decrease atelectasis, improve oxygenations, and decrease uh, ventilation-induced length injury. The third features in the winning, in addition of uh, in addition of RSBI, occlusion pressure, negative respiratory force, we have what we call SBT trial. SBT trial, continuous breathing trial, is one of the tools, very interesting to tools to, to, to do during the winning. It means you are winning your patient at pressure support. You give a pressure, PEEP and FiO2. It's the same things. The main difference here that you can set your own criteria. In, 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 uh, in addition of pressure support, if I have to unpeep, you set your own criteria, your winning criteria. Means what's the level of spontaneous frequency that the patient should have to win this patient, what's the, med the, the level of the tidal volume that you should, that the patient have, the level of ETCO2, SPO2, and pulse rate. And then 
he will uh, you you set the duration of the the, the 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 trial and you let the ventilators analyze the criteria with the the parameters the actual parameters that the ventilator measure so if the test is succeed they can show you they can tell you that the test is succeeded and you can proceed to do the winning so to to start extubating the patient so if it's not succeed they stop the spt trial and back to the previous mood so it helps too much because it's reduced the workload and you have a lot of criteria that you can set and it's very useful here you have all the trends so if the test is not succeeded you can see what's going on from the trends and here you have all the actual values last slides is uh, in the winning invasive ventilation all the ventilation discuss CPAP mode PSV also invasive and uh, bio level also and we have also the high flow oxygen therapy no need to have devices so you can call your ventilator have a high flow oxygen therapy. so thank you very much it's the end of my presentation hello Hello, hello. Yeah, we can hear you. It's okay. It's the end of, of the presentation. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Ayub, for that uh, presentation. And uh, once again, thank you for the uh, opportunity to partner with us. Uh, um, unfortunately, time is uh, pretty much gone. I think what we'll do at this point, uh, uh, Dr. Kelly will, will take uh, a few questions and uh, Dr. Joki and her panel will respond to, to a few of the questions. Uh, at the same time, Dr. Dr. Chikofe has an announcement to make uh, just before we get to the Q&A session. Dr. Chikofe, you still with us? Yeah, yeah I'm there. Good evening. Uh, good evening to you. Good evening to you. So, um, I do some logistics for the Kenya Journal of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine. Um, and we're looking for, you know, material to publish. We have quite a bit, we, our numbers are really big, yeah? our numbers are really high. And we're just appealing to the members of KSA and CCSK to come up with papers for publication. There's a lot of stuff that you could write on. Uh, if we don't do so, then this journal will unfortunately die a natural death. So I'm basically begging guys to submit articles for publication. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hello. You can thank you. access some of the questions on the chat. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nganga. Uh, I've been following on the on the chat box. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Kaiser Fitzwanga for your contribution on on this discussion. We really appreciate. Uh, Dr. Njoki, thank you. Now, there's a question here from Dr. Salim Nurani that uh, probably you will handle. Uh, he says, don't you think that by level mode and APRV settings can actually be achieved even when we're using our usual modes of ventilation? He feels that it's just the nomenclature that has been changed or added and actually we can, this can be done on our older versions of ventilators, considering that most of the ventilators you're going to have across the country are the older ones. What is your take on this, Dr. <coughs> Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Yoni. Yes, I had, as I had mentioned in one of the slides, most of the ventilators, for example, the bi-level, 
since it's the one which came first, we have modified uh, versions. We have mod we can modify it as as I said. BiPAP, CPAP, and APRE are variants. If you look at BiPAP and APRE, the difference is simply the time spent in the low pressure mode uh, session in the low pressure uh, region. For the APRE, is very short. And I think I had mentioned that um, for you to modify your BiPAP to mimic APRV, you can simply reverse the I to E ratio and increase the flow rate and then put the PIP at zero so that during expiration, the lungs are deflated very fast for a very brief period and then you breathe again at very high pressures. So there are ICUs where we do this because we don't have the APRV ventilators instead of putting an overhaul of the whole uh, system to buy new APRV vents. They're not cheap. But for you to do this, very many mistakes happen when people don't understand APRV and BiPAP. Sometimes I've come into the ICU, which have BiPAP machines, and I find very funny settings in an attempt to mimic APRV, which is not doing any good for the patient. So for me, um, I think my in summary, what I'm saying is, if you're not sure of a mode, don't use it, all right? Um, if you're sure of how to manipulate by level, you can go ahead, but you have to have a solid principle of how APRV and by level works. So it's possible, in other words. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Njoki. Now, uh, there was a question by Dr. Fitzwang again concerning the high frequency oscillatory ventilation. Dr. Fitzwanga, if you're with us, could you unmute yourself? There was a question that you had asked about the safety. Uh, I may not present it the way you put it. So if you're there kindly, could you ask the question? Um, thanks, uh, Njoki, for that very um, extensive and well-presented presentation. It's difficult to present uh, this topic in one hour. My question is about HFOB. And my experience is very limited to pediatrics because I'm a pediatrician. So we normally would set your, your mean air pressure about three to five centimeters above what you're using or what is measured in conventional ventilation. And you know, you set your alarm limits very tightly such that you know you can you 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 the your ventilator would not deliver anything below or above what you set within the limits. And actually, we, if you're using the sensory medics uh, HFOV ventilator, it, it will just start alarming and you have to either adjust your alarm settings or change your, your, your settings. So I was a bit uh, confused about the MCQ, you know, like when you say that the, M, the map in HFOV is double what um, is uh, given in uh, conventional ventilator. I want ventilation. I wanted some clarity on that. Thank you and over to you. All right. Thank you, Kaisa, for that. Um, Dr. Idris is in the panel. I think this is an, um, a question that we might need to brainstorm together. Now, the high frequency oscillatory ventilation. The advantages it gives is that it gives you a very high mean pressure because of the oscillations that are taking place. And the higher the frequency, the higher the hertz, the higher the pressures. And actually high frequency ventilation gives almost up to double the pressures in conventional ventilation. As we had seen that graph, I don't know whether I should share the screen again. We can try. Okay. Okay, there we are. So, sorry, let me just go to the high frequency ventilation. But there we are. So this is the superimposed uh, graph that I had shown. And you, you can actually see, this is the side for high frequency oscillation and this is the conventional. So what the conventional mode does is that it simply inflates and then deflates. The, the, the problem with this is that when you inflate and deflate, you can cause what you call a telectroma. So this, and you can also, uh, you cannot give these high pressures safely. 
But with the oscillatory, it creates a mean pressures. It basically just keeps those lungs open and can give pressures of up to 70. Now, the question that Kaiser, correct me if I'm wrong, you're asking is if this conventional mode is giving pressures of 30, which have been shown to be the maximum pressure safe in inflating a lung, why is it that the HFOV is giving pressures of up to 70? Isn't this causing by barotrauma in a lung, which is already affected by ARDS? Now, when I was going through my literature in HFOV, they said that this does not happen because high frequency oscillatory ventilation decreases the compliance of a lung. That means that lung is not closing and opening like in the usual conventional mechanical ventilation. And therefore, these high pressures see not in the just remain static like that. And therefore, to cause the pressure injury, like when you're using the conventional uh, ventilation. I will seek some assistance here with Idris, because that is what I found on my literature, but neither did I fully understand it. Or um, I, somebody else who has used the high frequency ventilation. Why is it that the pressures of 70 and above uh, that are explained as reducing the the compliance not affecting this lung, yet they're very high pressures. Yeah, Dr. Njoki, um, uh, I also do not have so much experience with high frequency oscillatory ventilation, but what I remember from the little experience is that you set your mean air pressure around five, cent five centimeters of water above your plateau pressure from your previous mode of ventilation. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, the amplitude it's not supposed to be above, you know, five centimeters of water, because I think uh, uh, pressures of 70 centimeters of water uh, may be dangerous, may actually give you adverse cardiopulmonary um, um, effects. So the little knowledge I have of high frequency, which does better in neonates compared to adult patients is that uh, the map is actually set five centimeters of water above the plateau pressure, uh, which is within uh, reach of a, a normal ventilator. And you may not certainly injure the lungs by having these relatively low settings. 70 to me uh, may not be very convincing. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Idris. I'd, I'd just like to um, just, um, I see Dr. Gavriya, maybe you can have Dr. Gavriya is raising her hand. She can, Dr. Gavriya. Hi, Joki, thank you very much for that very nice presentation. I just wanted to comment on uh, high flow oscillatory ventilation. And obviously my experience is limited to pediatrics because that's where, where I have used it extensively. The reason why it's thought not to cause trauma, it, like it says, you set the pressure at five centimeters of water above what your previous ventilation was. In neonates and in uh, the younger children, your compliance is actually uh, affected. You're almost like dealing with an ARDS picture. So you cannot uh, overly go above that pressure. And that is the reason of giving very low tidal volumes at very high frequencies so that you're attaining a ventilation or gaseous exchange at a level which the, you are not causing balotrauma. But cumulatively, if you think about the pressures of 70, you are unlikely to achieve that. Uh, with the rate that you're setting. If you look at your, at your presentation on amplitude and frequency, that, then you will see that uh, when you reduce the, uh, the next slide from that one. Or was it the one before that? When you say yes, so this, this one. So you, you see, you said about uh, the lower amplitude that uh, generate faster oscillations and less tidal volumes. Actually, that is where the jinx of the matter is, and that is what is uh, protective in this mode of ventilation. 
because if you set an IE ratio of uh, one to two, or sometimes we set one to 1.5, then your amplitude becomes low. And then you get faster uh, oscillation and less tidal volumes. So that in itself is uh, protective of the lungs. So you're not uh, blowing them too much. If on the other hand, uh, which sometimes can happen depending on the machine you have and the settings you have, because the IE ratio adjusts itself automatically as you set the frequency and the amplitude, you can <coughs> reverse the ratio. And this is where now you will get lung damage because your, your, your amplitude will, will, will have very high tidal volumes. But if you set the correct IE ratio, then it means you're getting very little tidal volumes and the pressures generated from that will be within the five centimeter of water, the plateau pressure of the previous uh, ventilation board. I don't know whether that makes sense. Right. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Gabi. It makes sense completely. Dr. Njoki. Yes. Also, the mechanism of oxygenation is a bit different here because we are not pushing those 500 mLs. Yeah. So what is happening is that it's, 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 the mechanism is what you call mass flow, you know, and there's movement of gas from one alveoli to another, what you call pendle laft. So at the end of the day, you find that the atelectatic parts of the lungs and the highly sort of distended lung, parts of the lung sort of tend to equilibrate and you have just a lung that is not moving. So it might not even be easy to measure compliance in such a situation because there's no big change in tidal volume because compliance, there has to be a significant change in volume divided by a change in pressure. So the lung is just open. It's basically not moving. That's why maybe it may be safer in uh, you know, preventing barrel uh, trauma because there's really no movement. Thank you very much, Idris, for the addition, Dr. Kavria. And I think that's where they are explaining that you reduce the compliance, you're just not moving that lung. So what is happening is that air is just vibrating within the lung tissue rather than just inflating and then deflating. All right, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Dr. Njoki and the panel. Uh, I'll take this chance to thank you for making this complex uh, subject look pretty easy and there's been a number of requests especially from the residents that you share this uh, presentation with them i think we can facilitate that thank you to crown for being part of us in delivery of this uh, cpd accredited activity thank you all the participants from the across the country i can see many of you are not even anesthesia we really appreciate your support and joining us those from the, across the continent, I see from Nigeria, Ethiopia, Uganda, Rwanda, Zambia, we really appreciate. Dr. Sunil from India, thank you very much. Those joining from Europe and Canada, we say asante ni sana. I hand you back over to Dr. Nganga to complete this and uh, maybe if he has any announcement to make. Thank you very much for participating. Uh, thank you, Dr. Okello. Actually, uh, yes, uh, we just want to say sorry again for the initial technical hitch, and uh, which has resulted in to us going way past the, uh, the time. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you to Crown Healthcare for your partnering with us. Uh, we say Asante Sana once again, and uh, we invite you for another uh, webinar next uh, Thursday, same time. Otherwise, for, the, for now, uh, you have a lovely evening. Wahirini. <laughs>